Captive by Rose Tremaine Owen Gibb grew up on a hundred-acre farm in South Norfolk, with apple orchards and a pond for geese and ducks, and fields of lush grazing for a fine herd of Herefords. Wooden chicken houses, set out across a muddy rise, were shaded by ancient oaks. In the cool dairy, butter was churned. When Owen's parents died, he had to sell the farm. What remained to him, when all the tax and all the debts had been paid, was a small bungalow, once occupied by his grandmother, and a piece of land, half an acre long, leading down to a quiet road. The new owners of the farm rooted out the apple trees and turned the dairy into a holiday cottage. Owen knew that it was important, with a legacy as meager as this, to make an immediate plan for it. Delay would get him nowhere. He was fifty and alone. His only companions were his black Labrador dogs, Murphy and Tyrant, and it was they who inspired his plan. He designed a set of boarding kennels. He'd heard you could make a good living out of people's longing to be rid of their pets, in order to holiday in Spain or Florida, or just to be rid of them, full stop. For that was part of human nature, a longing to be rid of the things you thought you might be able to love, and found you couldn't. All Owen had to do was build the kennels with care, make them solid and comfortable, so that he could designate them, superior. Long before the building work was complete, he'd chosen the wording for his sign. Gibbs Superior Dog Homing Facility. He set the kennels in two rows, running down towards the road, with a green exercise space to the west of them. In each pen, he installed a shelter, made of wood planking and bedded with straw, which reminded him of the old hen houses. The open areas in front, where the dogs could walk round and round, as prisoners do in a yard, were fenced with sturdy chain link. The flooring was concrete, the only practical solution, but underneath the concrete, Owen laid in a network of heating pipes that would run off the bungalow's oil-fired boiler. Your pet, Owen heard himself announce to his future clients, will never suffer from cold in this facility. He decided, too, that his kennels would be available to all comers. After failing to halt his plans at the local council office, the owners of the farm had tried to get him to promise that he wouldn't take in dangerous dogs, but he'd refused. He knew that housing Staffordshire pit bulls, Dobermans or Rottweilers would put up his public liability insurance premiums. But Owen Gibb was a man who felt some affection for all animals. It didn't trouble him that some of them possessed a harsh kind of nature. He thought he could have grown accustomed to wolves, or even jackals, provided only that there wasn't a whole pack of them, too many to love. Word circulated quickly around the local area. Gibbs Superior was the best and most economical place to board your dog. The food and shelter were good, with the heated floors providing reassurance in winter. The animals got proper exercise twice a week, in rotation according to their breed, size, and sex. And most important of all, if you stayed away longer than you'd agreed, Owen would always sort something out. Soon, Owen's booking ledger was so crammed that he began to consider nibbling some land from the exercise space, in order to extend the kennels beyond the thirty places provided at present. It troubled him to turn an animal away as though this act of his would condemn it to unacceptable suffering, or even death. Because people were hard-hearted, this he knew. If a pet stood between them and their restless desires, they weren't ashamed to have it put down, or turn it out into some wasteland, far from home, to fend for itself, whatever they thought that might mean. Owen drew up plans for ten more units. He hired a plumber to find a way of running a spur off the underfloor heating grid and ordered a second oil tank. Work was almost ready to begin when, on the first day of a new year, the kennels full to capacity with assorted borders, a front of Arctic weather drove south from Scandinavia and settled over East Anglia. Snow fell and rested on the frozen earth and piled up on the wooden roofs of the shelters. Owen stood at his front window, watching. The dogs came out of the shelters and smelled the frosty air and raised their heads into the whirl of snowflakes, trying to bite them as they fell. Though the blizzard was obliterating the path to the road, 
Owen was exhilarated to see that where it fell onto the concrete pens, it quickly melted. The heating pipes were doing their job. Owen knew the dogs would still be cold in these conditions, especially the two pit bulls he'd boarded since Christmas, whose smooth skin appeared almost as vulnerable to Owen as the skin of a man's body. But they'd survive. He'd increase their food ration, shred newspapers to add to the straw, put coats on the pit bulls and on the overweight little dachshund bitch called Cherry. It snowed all day, pausing at night to uncover stars and a deep frost, and began snowing again the following morning. It felt to Owen, as he worked on the paper shredding, as though the fat snow would never stop, but keep falling and falling into the heart of the year's beginning, blocking any artery that led to spring. But he and the dogs would endure it together, as the Herefords had endured it through his childhood, as the old apple trees had endured it, motionless in the wind, under their white burden. Two days later, Owen was woken at seven, in darkness, by the sound of the dogs howling. His bedroom was icy. He drew back the curtains and saw snow piled a foot high on the outer sill. He fumbled for the warmth of the radiator under the window, but it was cold. Owen tugged on a fisherman's sweater, cords and worn slippers and padded to the kitchen, where he knew what he would find. The boiler was out. The boiler was old, difficult to light. Owen knelt down and took the housing off the ignition box, smelling oil, surprised at how quickly the appliance, which had been burning strongly at midnight, had cooled. His hands were shaking. The sound of the dogs howling choked him. Murphy and Tyrant, their tails optimistically wagging, crowded round Owen's crouching figure, and he didn't push them away, but kept them near to him for comfort. He tried to think clearly. He spoke aloud to the Labradors. Useless to try to relight the boiler if snow's piled up on the chimney stack, eh, lads? He said. Murphy licked Owen's face. Tyrant's tail beat against the boiler housing. Boiler cut out straight off if there's anything blocking the outflow. So, what's to do next, Murph? Tyrant? Get a ladder, I guess, and clear the stack. Right? Then come back in and try the old relighting procedure. Pray it works. Owen tugged on heavy socks and boots and his warmest farm coat and opened the back door and Murphy and Tyrant went out to do their business, jumping through the snow to reach a favorite spot. But Owen stood motionless on the threshold of the door. Hoisting a ladder, clearing snow from the stack, these tasks didn't trouble him. What he dreaded was the sight that awaited him at the kennels. He sniffed the outside air and could guess at a temperature of minus five or six degrees. Animals without fur succumbed quickly to hypothermia in cold of this intensity. They were howling now, but unless he got the boiler going, they would soon enough fall silent. He's out in it now. He keeps looking back at his footprints in the snow, leading away from the oil tank, finding it hard to believe what he's just seen. He carries a bucket of high-protein food. He stands by the pens. Some of the dogs come out from the shelters and try to push through the deep snow towards him. He throws bits of food through the wire. There is no sign of the pit bulls. He longs for someone to help him. He thinks wistfully of the days when his parents were alive, companionable voices to console and advise. Because he's trapped. In the night, the coldest night of this winter, somebody came and committed a crime against him. He keeps vainly hoping that he's imagined it, but he knows he hasn't. Silently in the snow, these criminal people unlocked his oil tank and siphoned out every last drop of oil. Every drop. He believes these criminals are his neighbors, the family who walk the loved land where he grew up, but who detest him and his dogs and want to bring all his endeavors to nothing. He can't be sure it was them, of course and he believes that he will probably never get to the bottom of a thing so steeped in hate, but suspicion will linger. The very people who own what should have been his are intent upon his ruin. He must defy them. He's called all the oil delivery merchants he can find in the phone book. Most, because it's the week of the new year, aren't answering. Those that answer say demand for heating oil is so heavy they won't be able to get to him for another nine or ten days. 
Owen walks on slowly down the line of kennels. One of the pit bulls lies dead with his jaw clamped round the chain-link gate, as though trying to bite his way out. The dachshund, Cherry, is a lifeless, snow-covered mound. Owen shivers as he stares at the fat little corpse. From the bungalow comes the sound of his landline ringing, dog owners calling from ice-bound stations or airports, asking him to keep the dogs until the thaw comes. There will be no thaw. This is how it feels to Owen. He and the animals are imprisoned for all time in a frozen world. He tries to master his shivering and to think clearly. He knows that he has no choice. He will have to bring the dogs inside the bungalow. Twenty-eight dogs. He'll try to separate them, as he does for their exercise routine, so that they don't constantly mate and fight with each other. But still, their animal natures, confined, confused, will create turmoil around him. Their barking and howling and rampaging will fill his every waking hour and make sleep impossible. Murphy and Tyrant will cower in corners, hide in cupboards, their familiar territory usurped by strangers. And everything that Owen possesses will be torn and stained and brought to desolation. But there's no other way to save the dogs. No other way. He feels paralyzed, as though he's suddenly become ill or old. He turns away from the kennels and walks towards the house. The howling and whimpering of the dogs resume as they watch him leave. But he needs a moment of respite. He remembers that he still has electricity. He's going to make himself a cup of tea, something to warm him, at least, before he faces all that he has to face in the coming day. He fills the electric kettle. He stands waiting for the homely sound of its boiling to mask the noises outside which now come to him as though from a faraway country, a barbaric place, where there is no order or kindness, the sort of place he'd hoped never to inhabit. The End Is there a story you want to hear? Leave it in the comments below. Thanks for watching.